Welcome, my name is Anthony Lucas and today our topic is nightmares and parasomnia. To tell us more, we're joined by registered psychologist and Sleep Health Foundation board member, Dr. Maura Junger. Dr. Maura Junger has over 25 years experience in the healthcare sector and has worked in the sleep disorders field since 1994. Dr. Maura, I'm so extremely glad you're here. Thanks so much for joining us. So let's get straight into it, shall we? Yeah. Many of us maybe not have heard of parasomnia. So can you, what is it? Yes, well, it's a, it's a collective term for, that covers all sorts of sleep disorders that happen during sleep. So parasomnia, so in the middle of sleep, mm -hmm when you're, you think you're asleep, well, you are asleep, but there's all sorts of strange things going on. So things like um, sleepwalking, sleep talking, bed wetting, teeth grinding. You name yeah. it. You name it. There's a range of things we could wow. keep talking. People driving their car in their sleep, people cooking meals in their sleep. Wow. People um, having sexual phenomena in their sleep. Mm. So there's all sorts of things, which is called a sexomnia. Wow, okay. Um, so it's kind of like the brain's still awake. Is it's it? Interesting, yeah, interesting to say that. Well, so yeah, so during sleep, it's meant to, it's, it's actually experiencing um, phenomena that is um, yeah, a abnormal to what mm -hmm. we normally would expect in sleep. Mm -hmm. But having said that, a lot of things that happen, like sleepwalking, sleep talking, they, yes, they're abnormal, but they're sometimes not um, very common, not, not every night, mm. and they may not be very debilitating to that person. Because yeah. in, in fact, most of this stuff we're talking about um, and including nightmares, it's a, probably the, the most common parasomnia is uh, having a nightmare. Mm. Um, but mostly it doesn't necessarily affect people to the point where it's affecting their occupational functioning and or social functioning, mm. like in other things we've spoken about. Wow, okay. So what are the different types of insomnia you've said that those things like, uh, you know, sleepwalking and stuff, is that yeah. what, so that's obviously what can happen, but what yes. type? The different types, I guess. Yeah, well, I suppose, um, well, they're all under the same title of, mm. of parasomnia. Um, but let's, let, maybe we could just pick out one, for instance. Yeah. Like someone who perhaps is having nightmares, which mm. is the most common. Um, as, and, and everyone knows, I think everyone's had at least one nightmare. Like most people watching this would think, yeah, I, I understand what a nightmare is. Mm. But not everyone understands what, what other things are like, um, the, you know, driving not many people driving hopefully, their car, driving their car in, their in, in their sleep so well i would have thought like nightmares are associated with you know being scared and you know watching scary movies yeah well sometimes that's one of the triggers yeah um often nightmares could be from that if post-traumatically nightmares are, are a big feature that they, they are a, a diagnostic feature in, in fact of people who have um, a post-traumatic stress disorder mm. Often there's this, and it's it's thought to be like an, an it's intrusive. People are replaying things over and over. So in a in a way, obviously we don't want most of the nightmares are, are distressing, mm. um, and it affects your sleep in that way because yeah. you're still you're asleep. So we've talked through things like insomnia, hypersomnia, but a, a parasomnia is like it's during the sleep. So people don't know that they're having this, and mm. what happens is if you're actually thrashing about in bed or you know having these disruptive nightmares you will in fact feel very tired the, next, the next day but you may not know why okay. so so it's a it's an important it's an interesting part of of the sleep field mm. and, and one that we don't talk about much at all like, well, I guess that kind of leads me to my next question what causes it like is it genetic is it what is it yeah it can be it can be um, post-trauma Yep. It can be obviously post um, drugs, mm -hmm. like people like so drug and substance use. It can be very interestingly, ironically in a way, that it can be severe sleep deprivation mm. that can cause people to have this these parasomnias and and, and interest. So, so cruelly, really, like the, the so the more unwell you are, the more tired you are, the more sleep deprived you are, mm. the more likely you are to have a parasomnia. So so the young child, for instance, who might be a sleepwalker. They might be a bed wetter, they might be asleep, but they don't do it all the time. Yeah. They're very, very likely to have that para this parasomnia or, or a whole lot of them in the one night mm. on a Friday night, in the, on a hot night um, after school camp, for instance. So they've had a full week of being sleep deprived um, and, then, and, and also being a bit stressed, a bit out of sorts, a bit hot. So these things, have, so being, being stressed, being overstimulated, mm. 
being overheating, like being just so sort of sleeping too hot, like putting, you know, people might have flannelette pajamas and a, and a doona, mm. and other, th and, and they're more likely to have a, a disturbance, like they're more likely to have nightmares. Okay. Interestingly, we've talked previously about sleep apnea, mm. and with sleep apnea, it's very common that people might have associated nightmares too. Like as, as they're having the apnea and their oxygen saturation levels drop, it's very common to have nightmares. So sometimes treatment of nightmares in a sleep disorder setting mm. can be actually treating, like when, once people get their sleep apnea sorted out, the nightmares can go away. That, that can happen, which is interesting. Wow. Okay. So, so the, yeah, so the person, generally what I find, someone who has a parasomnia mm. um, and they're, they're, they're worried about it, they're worried enough to actually seek treatment for it mm. and, and that someone's alerted them to it because some people don't know if they're screaming out in their sleep. Yeah. So, so, so for example, night terrors, when a child or an adult has a night terror, which is different to a nightmare, like nightmares are often in REM sleep and the night terrors are in non-REM sleep, so not in the dreaming type stage of sleep. The night terror, when a person is screaming, I'm not sure if you've ever heard someone have a night no. terror, it's, it's shrill screaming, like it, it actually just chills you to the bone, you think, oh, wow. they must be, it sounds like someone's being murdered, like it's, it's, you could hear it probably next door. It's even. full on. Yeah, it's really full on, so you come running in and the child or the adult is dead to the world, they have no, and they don't wake up from it, yeah. and they have no memory of it in the morning or if they do happen to wake up shortly after that. Wow. So that's so mostly that's they don't type know. Of well, yeah, that's a, just a type. Yeah, night terror is a type of parasomnia. Well, uh, well, that kind of leads me to like, is it something that gets diagnosed? And if it is, how does it kind of get treated? Yeah. So yeah, yeah if it exactly. So if it's diagnosed, if someone it's, it's problematic for them, they end up seeking treatment and getting a diagnosis. It's, it's not often diagnosed. Sometimes over with a sleep study, but mm. but you have to be um, filming them, having a setup where you actually might be able to capture it on film. Right. Because otherwise you don't really know what's going on if you don't have that visual capturing of, of it. Yeah. So it's often just diagnosed on just on report. Like if you told me this is what happens, then I, I believe you don't have to go off into a lab and, and find out and get mm. a diagnosed. But the treatments would be really um, like looking, finding out like whether the, what the, the underlying cause is what's going to lead to the treatment. Mm -hmm. So making sure that people, um, like getting you sort of drugs and alcohol sorted, yeah. Um, not being too sleep deprived, so mm. making sure that you're, you know, getting adequate sleep every night, like a minimum six hours, even if, like you're doing lots of shifts or you're doing lots of you're as busy as anything, so really get your minimum six or seven, preferably, you know, eight or seven or nine. But, but just because we people are routinely getting less than six hours, they've got a much higher risk of having this parasomnia. Wow. So my interesting situation is when I was, when I used to be a nurse um, years and years and years ago, Doing, we used to do like long shifts, like 10 hours of shift of like night shift. So coming home from a night shift and then sleeping in during the day, I would actually, apparently, I was, I was having um, parasomnies, like getting up, walking around, thinking the overhead bed lamp was a, an IV pole and trying to fill up the IV, like what I was doing. So, And you didn't realise. Didn't realise, and, and it's usually, it was because I was in a se severely sleep deprived state. Yeah. So we need to make sure that people aren't in a sleep deprived state, make sure that they're not, if you just tidy up their diet, alcohol, stress, not be too hot at night, mm. all those sorts of things. Just reducing stimulation. Yeah. Will Does be, that count for the same as children? Because I can imagine like, obviously children aren't going to, most likely, hopefully not going to be on, you know, the alcohol and substance kind yeah. of field. Like, yeah. is it the same treatment for them? Yeah, for the children, to, yeah, making sure, for sure, like making sure they're not too stressed, making sure they're not overheating. Um, interestingly, sometimes if you're just getting a bit of a cold or a bit of a virus, mm. you, this, the first part of that, when your body temperature is a bit high, you've got a little bit of a temperature, you're more likely to have the, the parasomnia then. So making sure that sort of stuff is checked out, like that the, the, the body temperature is kept low during yeah. during a fever. Um, so it's, it's really a multifactorial approach around mostly educating people that a lot of the time it's not very dangerous some mm. people are, say sleepwalking can be can be very very upsetting for for people but a lot of people who have sleepwalking never get treatment their whole life yeah because they, they just sort of they're not worried about it but once someone's had a dreadful situation where they've sleepwalked and they found them out on the highway yeah that's a that's a, something that you think well i need to get that sorted that's really dangerous so the yeah. so medication so a combination of um, medical and psychological um, approaches where sometimes people might be put onto some certain medications that sort of keep them quite still during the night. Just literally, they can't really thrash around too much, and then yeah. and their sleep quality is deeper, so they're yeah. not likely to have it. 
Um, so in, from my point of view, people who, like, who, who want to reduce their likelihood of their teeth grinding or their having nightmares, and it's, it's really around you know, stress management and reduction of just too much arousal in their, in their world. Wow. Well, is there anyone that's, like, who is more kind of, who, who is more likely to experience uh, parasomnia? Yeah, the, so it's people who are, the, so you're more likely, you're more susceptible to a parasomnia if you have had trauma yeah. or you've got some, like some, um, or if you're using um, or, or abusing substances. Yeah, and, would you say it's like more kind of men, women, children? or uh, Yeah, like across the board, everyone. across the board, like men, women, children, and across all the lifespans of ages, so gender and age all, all across. Mm. There's not that much difference with susceptibility, but but more so with the person who's just carrying um, too much stress, mm. or the person who's sleep like sleep depriving themselves and shooting themselves in the foot. Like you can be so sleep deprived that you end up having this sort of um, psycho it's almost psychotic. Like you have hallucinations. It's like feeling mm. like you're not quite sure about reality anymore. Wow. So the um, yeah the population is it's really making sure that. Uh, people are aware that in, in, in what they are and that the, in general not a lot of treatment is needed but when treatment is needed that you would go to a sleep disorders center mm. um, a, a sleep disorders particular like a sleep disorders physician physician someone who's actually had training mm. in sleep yeah and would understand um, a if treatment is needed um, and education around that and be like this yeah, a combination of um, some medications that can work yeah or actually just these lifestyle changes, these non-drug strategies, similar to the ones that we have for insomnia, mm. just making sure that you're you know, bringing down the stresses, of et cetera. Life. Yeah, just not being too concerned about it. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's something that a lot of people kind of need to become aware of. Would you say in, you know, just, just quickly, mm. if you're kind of living alone, do you know that you're having insomnia? Yeah, I'm kind a, of really interested a parasomnia. In that. Yeah, a parasom no. A parasomnia. Sorry. No, that's the thing. And mostly, mostly you're not aware if you, yeah, if you don't have a bed partner or someone to, to, you know, tell you what's going on. Yeah, you just don't can't know about it. It's yes. really interesting. Well, thanks again for joining us. It's been absolutely amazing to have you. Uh, we hope you gained some insight into our topic today. If you'd like to find out more on today's topic, you can head to the Sleep Health Foundation website, sleephealthfoundation.org.au. I'm Anthony Lucas. Take care and stay healthy.